Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Um, and thank you all for joining us for today's conversation. Um, if I could please first start by asking everybody to silence their cell phones. Um, before we begin, I would also like to thank JP Morgan Chase for supporting this public program today here at the Art Institute of Chicago. Uh, my name is Miguel Perez. I am the Associate Director of Engagement Programs, and I am thrilled to have you joining us here for this exciting look at the recent conservation of the Michigan Avenue Lions. This afternoon, we have the pleasure of hearing, for, we hear, have pleasure from hearing for, from our conservation team. Um, Andrzej Dianowski, um, conservator at Conservation and Sculpture, Conservation of Sculpture and Object Studio, Rachel Sabino, Director of Objects and Textile Conservation, and Sarah Kelly Oler, Field McCormick Chair and Curator of Arts of the Americas. They'll share a little bit about the, res the restoration of the lions and what it took to get the lions looking cleaner and greener than ever. Um, thank you all for being here and please welcome me and join us, our speakers. Thank you, Miguel, and welcome everybody. We're so glad to have you here today, um, even on April Fools. Um, I'm Sarah Oler. My mic is not on. Well, that's not good. Uh, all right, is it better now? All right, it's apparently on, so let's try that. Um, so I am Sarah Oler, as Miguel mentioned, and I'm the chair of the Arts of the Americas department. And as a curator, we always have the responsibility of working with our colleagues in conservation on conserving and displaying our wonderful collection. Um, and so last summer, we had the amazing opportunity to do probably one of the more unusual projects of certainly my career, and that was to conserve our wonderful Michigan Avenue lions. Now, what most people don't realize is that these are actually part of the collection, just like the Syrah, like the Kayabat, and so on. And so it's actually one of my responsibilities to help think about how to take care of them. And I do so with my colleague, Rachel, and then we work with Andre um, as needed. So I wanted to give you a little bit of background, just a minute or two, um, about the lions because, um, because they're just a fixture. We're sort of used to seeing them. But in 1893, the Art Institute moved into this Michigan Avenue home, and we had already decided to commission lions. And you can actually see them in this 1892 drawing. And so the Art Institute turned to Edward Kemmies, who was sort of the leading animal sculptor of the day. Uh, he had just absolutely wowed people at the World's Columbian Exhibition in 1893. And he often worked with his wife, Laura, you see here on sort of massive commissions such as the lions. And so they um, created the design. They had it founded or cast locally. And I'm showing you on the right here, Kemi's signature and then actually his little wolf head, head symbol that is on the lion still. Um, which is hard to see, and we don't actually encourage you to go looking for it, but um, just, you know, appreciate that. Um, so the lions were unveiled in May of 1894, so they really have been part of our history um, all of this time, and you can see they were, they were set free, according to the Tribune, on May 10th, um, and since that time, they've really stood guard over the museum's steps. They've, you know, celebrated the seasons. They've celebrated our sports teams when they're doing well. Not a lot recently. Um, and, you know, and have really taken on this sort of wonderful, iconic status. But they've also, in all of that time, become this very familiar minty green. And this is where I want to start um, the conversation off because um, in the end, this was something that we felt this was the moment to take care of it. After, frankly, a history of not taking, not really conserving these lions. And so Rachel, I mean, I think this was a real surprise to you to realize how little they had been treated over the years. That's true. As, as you can see, we have some evidence of some activity around the lions, but, but there are no formal records of them having been treated on the scale that we treated them this past summer. Um, we, it's worth saying, though, that they, they have been moved before. Uh, that was in 2002, but it, it, wasn't, uh, it wasn't for cleaning. And it, it, was, it was you, Andre, who 
uh, oversaw that movement, and you know, we it was a very different mandate. What what were we doing there? It was not for cleaning, but well, <clears throat> at that time, what was very important, the bases in front of the museum started slight kind of sinking at the front, and the lions could have pretty much slide forward. They were not attached at all, <clears throat> and uh, the depth of the kind of sinking was about six to seven inches, which is significant. And uh, at that time, we made a decision that the lions will be moved temporarily to the garden and protected there. And the bases were jacked up and permanently fixed, so they are not going to sink anymore. Uh, at that time, there was another thing that uh, I suggested. It was that lions are not attached permanently, but they are installed in such a way that there are brackets preventing any movement in any direction for the lions. So they cannot be pushed off their bases, even if many people wanted to do it. And uh, if anybody wanted to lift them, it was possible. It still is possible because the flanges are about this tall. But to lift this sculpture this tall requires a crane. Right. Which we will definitely Which talk about. Exactly um, part of the, uh, right. the, uh, but before we get there, I mean, so we can see this minty green patina here. Why, why now? Why did we decide to clean them at this moment? Um, and, you know, again, we've used this in our marketing. We've been everywhere with this minty green color. Yeah, I mean, the green is practically part of their identity up, up to now. Uh, as you can see by this mug here. But um, I, I like to play a, a quite mean trick on our audiences, and I, I get you thinking you're coming here to hear about artwork, but actually you're coming here to hear about uh, some chemistry. And um, this, this is an example of, um, uh, this is a quite famous cathedral um, that uh, has this same sort of color. And so you may be asking yourself, you know, I, I go around my daily life here in Chicago, even I see this color green everywhere. What's so bad about it? And um, here is where I'm taking you back to your uh, physical science class in eighth grade. This is a, this is a copper atom because bronze is an alloy of copper, meaning it's copper and some other things. Uh, there in the center, you see the, the nucleus, and then all around is this sort of electron cloud. And you can see on that outermost ring there, there's only one electron, which is quite an unstable configuration, which means that the, the copper, that electron wants to move around and, and join up with other things in the, in the atmosphere, of which there are many. And as a consequence of that reactivity, we have all sorts of compounds that form on the surface of, of sculptures. You see many of them here. But the bottom one there, chlorides, um, is the one that is doing some damage. We, we, we start to get a bit nervous if we have chlorides on the surface. So that was, that was part of the motivation of, of doing a much more uh, intensive cleaning and um, surface, uh, what should we say, stabilization than, than, than is sometimes normal in, in the course of conservation practice where we're just sort of cleaning things out in the garden. So the impetus to remove them was so that we could actually do far more to them than we would do uh, on site. And um, so that meant, of course, that meant moving, moving them. them. <laughs> I mean, and, and this is where, you know, again, I've moved a lot of works of art around the museum. And this was this was a highlight. I mean, this is not every day that I wear a hard hat in my profession, um, frankly, and, you know, stand around and do this. And so, you know, talk, walk us through what it was like, um, all the prep work that went into um, picking up these massive lions and getting them onto a truck. Massive amount of logistics. I mean, as you can see, we, we needed to close off one lane of Michigan Avenue. Uh, which required a lot of conversations and paperwork with the city. Um, the, the press was, was watching. Um, so all of our teams, our, our buildings team, our security teams, this involved everyone. And, you know, uh, involved our trusted colleague, Andre, who has lifted and moved many, many, many sculptures over the course of his career. And actually, there's a very specific term we use for moving things like this, which is, which is rigging. And I, I just... 
I would love it if you would explain the, you know, what, what sort of informs your thinking about how to actually pick up something like this and move it. When lifting any sculpture, it's always very important to eliminate completely any risk at the moment when the sculpture goes up. <clears throat> and in this case, uh, the lion that you see with the straps uh, was rigged in such a way that there are three straps that are actually of the same length, but because they are put into the, onto the sculpture in different spaces, th essentially they become very uneven. And in order to get rid of that, I used a very simple trick. I uh, used pretty much moving blankets that were stuck underneath uh, of the belly of the uh, lion. And then this way, the, uh, the adjustment was made of the length of the straps. You can pretty much shorten or extend the length of the straps, and that's always possible. But uh, it's not as precise as sticking something as simple as a, as a moving blanket. It's a very simple solution. Very important it is in a case like this that when you start lifting the sculpture that it goes perfectly up, that it doesn't go kind of like this, that front comes up and the bottom goes uh, kind of low because then the sculpture can start sliding in the straps. And <clears throat> in this case, because we've done it in 2002 and uh, th th the last year it was uh, pretty much same procedure, but with different equipment, uh, it was kind of repeating the steps. So by eliminating any risk, the, the lines went essentially up like this. And it was very important when we brought them because they were going back into their kind of uh, flanges or the spaces that were kind of blocked on the, on the pedestal, uh, that they go perfectly in place and that there is no movement uh, either way, left or right, uh, as they were installed. And I, I want to say how much um, judgment and experience goes into something like this, because if, if something is up in the air and starts to tip, it's not a thing that you can sort of correct quite quickly. You, you usually have a very uh, alarming, dangerous situation. So it, gauging the weights of these kinds of objects and where that um, tipping point is and where its center of gravity is, um, is something that uh, is a, a very specific skill. So we're very grateful to Anjay for uh, being able to do that thought process on our behalf. Um, and then the act of getting them uh, to your, yeah. your facility in Forest Park was the source of a lot of social media attention. The, the, this was actually probably my, one of my favorite photos to come out of that day. And this was actually not from the Art Institute. This is a photo taken by someone on the blue line. So imagine you're sitting there on the train, you know, and you're bored and you're reading your iPhone and whatever, and you look out and you see the lions cruising by, I think would be a really exciting moment. Uh, so that went viral, which was really charming. And so here's a little video of them joyriding out to Forest Park. Um, in there, you know, and we got questions like, why aren't they inside the truck? And it's like, well, they're outdoor sculptures. They don't need to be inside of a truck. Um, but it was definitely an experience to see. And so they, they made their way out to Forest Park, to Anjay's facility. And I, I guess I, you know, I, I'm a museum-based conservator, which means I get to sit in a sort of cushy uh, air-conditioned space uh, with the heat on when it's necessary and the air conditioner on when it's necessary. But working with uh, objects of this nature is extremely, extremely different, requires different set of facilities and equipment. And so, Andre, I mean, if, I, if you could just give our visitors a, you know, a quick snapshot of the inside of your space and the kinds of space you need and equipment and so on. We have 13,000 square feet, and uh, <clears throat> this door allows to bring sculptures that are up to 144 inches tall. Um, quite often, uh, we get to the point that I would want to have bigger door, taller space, but uh, sculptures like this and the buildings are treated then in place. Here, bringing the lions to our studio was very important because we had completely controlled environment. There was no rain, no wind, or anything to control, and actually no public to deal with, which was not exactly true because almost everybody, almost every day, there were people knocking on our doors and wanted to come in and talk to us. 
Yeah, we're nosy. I mean, yeah. certainly we want to know what's happening at all times and excited I, I, about I it. I was amazed when uh, we brought the lions in front of our studio. People stopped driving and they just like, got out of their cars, were standing and watching. My neighbors are just amazed when something like this happens, that we bring something so important. Uh, I wanted to ask, Andre, I mean, you've had so many different types of uh, objects in and out of there, but what, what was it like having you know, these icons of the city of Chicago in your space? Uh, this was challenging because I had to say to many people that they cannot come in. Uh, we had Alma Mater from University of Illinois, which was another icon, and uh, other sculptures, other objects that were important, but lions beat everything. They, they were so popular and everybody wanted to come and see them. Uh, even my family, they, they, they see me working on all kinds of things, but lions for everybody in my family were special. I mean, and I think one of the things that struck me also is that, you know, these were really almost essentially at ground level. I mean, so that was, it was a chance for us to get up close and, and personal with the lions in a way that we even we don't before. do when they're on site at the museum because they're on their pedestals. So that was, you know, when I shot the photograph of the, you know, of his insignia, for example, is because it could be easily accessed and, and we don't always have that access or we normally don't have that access. And if I asked any one of you how tall the lions are, probably everybody would make a mistake. I did too, because they look small in front of the building, but when you have them right next to you, you are pretty much not that tall in comparison to the sculpture. They're about 13 feet tall and about that long. So they are huge. And they weigh about 5,000 pounds each. Yes, that, that was a key question, certainly, is, you know, what is the weight of these? Um, so, you know, I mean, I think once we had them out there, we, we knew that there were certain things we wanted to get done. And one of them was just to think about cleaning them and sort of processes of cleaning them. Because this is, you know, 130 years of dirt. And... You know, and rain helps, but, you know, there's salt. We've all been in Chicago in the winter when, you know, you end up a little bit filthy. And that was certainly true of the lions. And so, you know, um, very quickly you moved into cleaning them. And so we do have a photo of that. But can you talk about sort of the process of steam cleaning them? Yeah, no, it looks, it looks like a power washer, but it's, it's, it's a very different thing. It's high-pressure steam. So share the difference. I... When we started cleaning them, well, there was only one option. I didn't want to use any high pressure water or any pressure that would remove too much of the color corrosion from the surface. But at the same time, you would be surprised. There was not only corrosion, there was also green biological growth. And uh, there were just mud wasps, uh, nests spread all over the surface, especially in the areas that you couldn't see. The mouth of the lions had many mud wasps nests in, in them. <clears throat> and a lot of dirt. There was chewing gum stuck on many parts. And uh, to remove all of that, the simplest way to do it is to use just simple steam. But then we used uh, Orvis, which is commonly used uh, detergent in conservation that allows us to clean the surface. We didn't want to use biocides because that could affect the surface, the color of the surface. So only steam and uh, pretty much soap were allowed for cleaning. And then we used nylon brushes so we wouldn't uh, scratch the surface too deeply, wouldn't remove too much of the corrosion. The process took a lot of time, but uh, it was safest way to clean. And this was also the, when we say cleaning, this was also the, the phase during which we dealt with the, the chlorides. And uh, it's quite a, quite a dramatic uh, solution. So how, how did you deal with that, Anji? Um, luckily, there is a very simple test. When you expose copper alloy to heat from a torch, it emits this green flame, which indicates very clearly that there are chlorides on the surface. The chlorine gas gets emitted and it produces this interesting color. But it also says that chlorides on the surface exist and they will corrode the bronze for as long as they are there. So could we show maybe? And this is just, you see those tiny spots kind of flickering and popping out? Those are 
areas where there is a lot of chlorides, they pretty much explode off the surface. And <clears throat> it is very important to understand that we removed as much of the chlorides as possible, but not all of them. Uh, complete removal of the chlorides would require removal of most or almost all of the corrosion products that would bring the browns to the surface, I mean, to the color of just a pretty much bare metal, which nobody wanted to achieve, but everybody was interested in removing as much of chlorides as possible. And when we reached the point that those, the, those flames were not that green anymore, it was a stopping point. We knew that we were leaving chlorides behind. And we also knew that the sculptures are going to go back to their location, which is Michigan Avenue, that is going to be covered with salts every winter. So that would be unrealistic to think that we are going to get something pristine, perfect, and then they will go back to where they are, and chlorides are going to be put on the surface all the time, every winter. So, so if anyone was wondering where the chlorides are coming from, indeed, it's from the salt on the, on the roads. Um, that's a very common procedure used everywhere, and uh, Chicago is not any different. There are many sculptures. The spray from the salt can, can travel a really long distance, and the sculptures are sitting right next to the street. So this point of stopping, we discussed this, uh, came where we had significant reduction in chlorides visually, and 100% uh, removal was not really desirable because chlorides were all over the surface, but they are most concentrated in crevices, in the areas where water can stay longer and salts can accumulate and grow. So that would be the main of the lions, the armpits, uh, area under the the, the main and uh, small spots that uh, are going to create crevices on the surface, which is pretty much the entire sculpture. And what, what would happen if we left them, especially in these deeper pits, is it's kind of a, a self-perpetuating reaction that ultimately bites through the metal. If you, if you leave it there and don't address it, you wind up with a situation where you just have a sort of non-existent substructure and just these pustules of, of chloride. So Maybe I'd like to say one more thing. There are, the people call uh, chloride corrosion quite often bronze disease. It is not. It's contaminated surface with chlorides, but bronze disease, it's a process where you've got basic copper chloride that if you add to it water, it will keep continually see corroding the bronze until it creates complete destruction in the metal. These chlorides are a bit more stable, not very stable, but a bit more stable because they are combined with other corrosion products and they do not create this waxy, green material, they still are looking like other green corrosion uh, that you see on the surface. But I mean, I think one thing that strikes me just now as we're talking is also that in essence, I mean, this is this sort of conservative approach is one that we follow with a lot of works at the Art Institute. We're not looking to eradicate hundreds of years of history that an object went through. I think it's always a sort of balancing act that we face when choosing how far to go with any treatment. And that seems equally true here. Very much so. And in including um, some of these aesthetic concerns right, too. Right, which we'll, we'll get to in a minute, I think, um, right here as a matter of fact. I mean, so this was, this was the sci-fi moment of the treatment for me, again, as a curator who stares at email a lot, was the, the visit that we had to discuss lasering. And, um, and sort of what level of laser treatment we would take and, um, and really to discuss the sort of aesthetic questions. But before we get into what, what, am, what am I even talking about? What is the lasering and why are we lasering the lions? Because even that phrase is kind well, of comical. The, the feature in question too, I think is worth pointing out. Those long drips uh, at the back of the leg, that's, that's what we call copper runoff, where basically copper ions are in the solution and, and leave these streaking uh, uh, patterns, which are in places they're disfiguring, in places they're sort of uh, signs of age and so on. So uh, it was a judgment call area by area with you, Sarah. But to deal with that, um, laser treatment was, was very effective. And um, lasers have been around in conservation for, you know, two, three decades. But um, 
Andre has developed a particular expertise in, in laser cleaning. And, and what, when we say laser cleaning, what does that actually even mean? The process technically is called ablation, which means that light energy reacts with what's on the surface and uh, selectively we can remove in that process pretty much what we want. This is the only technique that allows us for extremely precise cleaning. <clears throat> uh, with the same laser, different settings, you can clean the, this sculpture or any metal to bare metal. You can clean the surface to get brown copper oxides, or you can clean the surface to the level that will keep some of the green, some of the black, but will blend everything in. And uh, because of the level of control, I was able, after discussing what we are going to do, what we want or don't want to keep on the surface, I was able to remove, for example, those streaks that you see on the right leg, and maybe we could play the, play the video, yes. We have a little video of it. So this setting is allowing me you see visually the green is disappearing on the top and it's kind of evening out the look of the surface. It's not that I wanted to remove everything completely. I wanted only to remove what was aesthetically not acceptable. And because of the level of precision that these lasers have, I had that luxury. And if I had to do this chemically or with any other method, it was physically it was completely impossible. Only laser, this type, this particular laser is giving uh, us the, this chance. These lasers are built for conservation, used by a conservator, actually by my son. And uh, he makes the lasers so precise that you can control every single setting in increments of one. And for, for example, from 10,000 to, uh, to 10 million of impulses per second, from one rotation to hundred, uh, sorry, to thirty thousand rotations per minute, uh, and then there are many other parameters that you can control. So if you have three uh, three unknowns, you have nine possibilities. If you have millions, you've got uh, pretty much millions of options to choose from. That's why it's important to know what you are doing. With also the added, I mean, it is worth pointing out too that uh, if you don't have to work with solvents and chemicals, it's certainly much better for us from a health and safety perspective as well. So that's an additional uh, point in the plus column. That's a huge plus. In addition, there is another extremely big plus. If you use chemicals, you need to wait for them to react. Here, in a fraction of a second, you see what you have done. You have to be a complete idiot to continue if you see that you are damaging something. With chemicals, you don't have to be an idiot. You have to go for a five minute break and you come back and chemicals did something that you didn't want. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's certainly something that seemed very sort of gratifying right away, very controlled. And, you know, and I think that in our approach, again, we took a fairly conservative approach where you can see in this photo even, those just look like drips. You know, that was an instance where we said, those look not like they should be there. They look drippy. Whereas there was other green, you know, we were not going to laser the entire surface of the lions um, because we'd still probably be working on it. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, just really focusing on areas that clearly to our eyes, um, you know, from a foot away, from six feet away, looked like it needed some help. Or looked um, uncared for, right? Yeah. It, it looked un, untended or unmaintained. Uh, whereas, you know, there, there is this sort of artistry in, in generating uh, uh, an aura of well-loved, uh, but also well taken care of, well, you know, aged, but also in a controlled fashion. So the drips were, I think, one step beyond the, the line of which we, we were sending out a good message about the lines too. So, I mean, ultimately then, we needed to think about how to preserve these lions for the future. I mean, these, this is 130 years that they've um, been on the steps and certainly you know, Rachel and I had conversations. We're well aware that we're just, you know, a brief moment in the lives of these lions. And we, we want to do our part to ensure that 
you know, conservators and curators 200 years from now have, you know, the ability to think about caring for these lines as well as part of a larger continuum. So what amazed me and what's really been fascinating for a lot of people is that it seemed like the most simple solution to help preserve them for the long term. And that was simply wax. And, you know, I mean, not any old wax that you buy, but like very carefully formulated wax, but nevertheless wax. And so, um, you know, tell me about why wax does any good. What's, how does the wax help? Yeah. What, what are we, uh, we're, we're trying to sort of strike a balance between keeping things in and keeping things out sort of, a. um, Certainly wax is water repellent to some extent, so that helps. But, um, you know, you've devised this very specific wax to withstand many years of activity. It's not not just a question. I mean, there's wax that we all are familiar with, and that would hold up for some amount of time. But it's another thing to to, uh, try to apply a coating that's going to last, you know, three, five years at a time. Um, So tell us about your... Uh, formulation. <clears throat> this is a very hard wax that, uh, in a way, uh, prevents corrosion for longer period of time, from three to five years. And uh, the way this wax is applied, we heat up the surface. Little video. There you go. Oh, perfect. We heat up the surface with a torch, and then wax is applied with a brush wax gets molten onto the surface. Well, there is a big difference between waxing in the so-called cold wax process or hot wax. <clears throat> cold wax is pretty much applying wax to the surface and wax doesn't go deep. It just stays on the surface. Uh, hot wax penetrates the surface of the bronze corrosion and seals it. It becomes in a way one with the corrosion layer and the surface of the sculpture. It also penetrates crevices, intergranular crevices of the metal. And by doing that, we are getting from material that uh, is relatively inert, something that is pretty much weather resistant and much more weather resistant than other waxes. I always prefer to apply hot wax because it seals the surface really well. And uh, It's uh, not, uh, this particular wax can be applied in a stick form or in a paste. Stick form requires, uh, stick means the wax is completely solid. You you need to heat up the surface a little bit more and you need to apply the wax and wax pretty much spreads over the surface by heat that is uh, generated in the metal. And it's a it's a beautiful thing to watch, you know, the the torch heats up the surface of the object and as the as the wax, which is sort of, you know, solid in the can goes on. And it, it's amazing the degree to which it really flows and moves like a liquid. Um, so you, you really know you're, you're getting it where you want it to go. I mean, and so we did three coats of wax. Um, you know, why is that the magic number? Like why three? Um, And how long did it take? Well, it didn't take that long, but the magic thing in it is that nobody's perfect. And I always assume that if we apply only one coat of wax, we are going to miss something. So by doing second coat of wax, we are kind of checking if we missed anything. And by adding to those areas, it's actually very obvious. You see right away that there are areas that have more wax or less wax, of course, if you know what you are looking for. And then adding wax in the areas that uh, were missed, it pretty much gives the warranty that the wax is applied evenly. And then at the very end, uh, I like applying cold wax as a paste and then heating this whole thing into one layer of wax. So first layer is just to make sure that everything that requires wax gets it. Second is to check yourself. And third one is to provide 100% warranty that you've done a good job. And you don't really have the physical separation between the there, layers no by using the, that, yes. the torch and on multiple passes. So it, it becomes this fused, fused layer along the whole. And there is one very important point. If you apply too much wax, it will look like white spots. It will uh, blanch on the surface. It's not always pleasant. It's nothing horrible, but nobody wants to see it on the sculpture. 
No, we're looking for green lines, not white lines, <laughs> except in the snow. But so, you know, this was also a moment, 130 years in the making, to consider x-raying the lions. I mean, x-rays were more or less invented when these were made. <laughs> and so, but we had never done it. We had no idea what the internal structure of the the casting was, sort of how it was being all held together. And we were, you know, we really saw this as sort of the moment that was the sole opportunity in our lifetimes that we would probably be doing this. Very so, much so. This was a once in a generation and going yeah. forward, uh, there's likely not going to be a chance for this to happen again. And uh, and it definitely uh, reaped dividends. We we know so much more about them. We knew we knew nothing, really. We, we could have make, made some sort of assessments based on what we know about other sculptures, but um, these were cast in, in many pieces, uh, joined together with a technique called um, Roman joining. And Andrea, if you wouldn't mind just explaining a bit about what that is. A Roman join comes, obviously, the description of the term from the Roman times. When the bronzes were cast at that time, they didn't have welding, and uh, they connected the bronzes in such a way that it is, in a way, putting a, sleeve, a, a, tu a kind of a sleeve into a tube and then connecting them together by putting a pin through it. So that's uh, one of the oldest techniques used for connect connecting bronzes. Today, bronzes are essentially welded. But uh, if you look at any old sculpture, they will have quite often uh, iron pins going through bronze, which is also a mistake because iron gets corroded by, in galvanic reaction by the bronze and eventually you don't have a pin connecting the pieces. Many, many sculptures are made in a correct way. We wanted to make sure that lions do not have iron pins. We wanted to make sure that irons have connections with bronze pins. That's why X-raying was so important. And the process of, of doing something on this scale is is also fairly fantastic. You in this image here on on your left, yes, <laughs> um, you see this yellow box about the size of a lunchbox. That's actually the radiation source. And so uh, you you work with a mobile company that comes out. Of, are they coming out of Indiana? Yes. Yes. So, um, you know, a, a truck from Indiana comes with a, a radiation source in the back and uh, a lab in the back to develop the x-rays as well. And so you, you set up the source and you can see behind the, behind the leg, uh, we've got the film being, you know, held up against it. And then everybody leaves the room, right? Everybody goes out front uh, so that the source can be activated and the image is captured um, you know, through the leg and onto the film behind, and then it's taken out to the truck. And uh, so very, very different from this sort of hospitalized image we get of x-rays. This is a fairly rough and ready procedure, but uh, as you can see by the, the level of detail and the, the quality of the results are, are fantastic. And, and for us, this, this was huge to see. Um, what is very important to add that if you wanted to this x-raying in lo on location, you would have to close Michigan Avenue. And uh, the distance that if you are in the open air, it's minimum 100 feet of nobody. During the time when the x-ray is shot, probably this is a longer distance. So in, in a building, we, could, uh, well, we have walls that create barriers. And uh, if we go behind a wall, we are safe. So safety of public uh, would pretty much make it impossible to x-ray x-ray the sculptures uh, on Michigan Avenue. So this was the only time when we could do it. But I mean, I think this, this image is really interesting because it gives you a sense of how large the x-ray piece is. I mean, that black film is what, sort of 10 by 12 at most? Um, so how many x-rays are we talking about for the entire lion? Do you even know? Did you count? <laughs> we, we didn't do the entire thing. No. We, we did mm. what we could. There were some, some places where it was just physically there is not, also cost not possible. Associated <laughs> yeah, true. With there it. is cost. <laughs> we, we, we've done about 60 x-rays yeah. for both sculptures. We did all four legs, right? Four legs, Faces. heads. Where we were thinking that there could be a problem, we x-rayed. Uh, obviously, you could actually the entire piece, but it would take probably a few months. We worked for three days to get the 60 pictures. 
And the, the taking one picture can take from 30 seconds to five, 10 minutes, depending on the thickness of the brows. So yeah, I'm very glad we did it. I'm glad hopefully we don't have to do it again. And of course, you know, future technologies yeah. might arise, but this and will keep us. A, we've mm -hmm. done a yeah. huge service for people who come after us. I mean, if, yes, anyone, done. Um, if anyone needs to uh, sort of interpret, especially around the legs in these areas of vulnerability, now we at least have a record of what's inside there. Yeah. We didn't find anything, but actually we found something interesting when we were x-raying the tail. Yes. That's the next subject. I think that's next. I mean, that was <clears throat> the, the one thing we actually really didn't talk about in public a whole lot. Um, and that was a very old break that had happened in the tail and had been repaired. And it just clearly wasn't holding up as a repair at this point. It didn't. I know it, it almost offended you, Andre, <laughs> like looking it, at it. It was unsightly. And mm -hmm. also, I mean, we, we didn't have any information about when it, it was it was done with lead. Um, and we didn't have any information about when it was put in. Um, and so we, it, it was important to us to sort of vouch for its stability. So here too, we had a, a rare opportunity to correct a past intervention, which is a lot of what we do in conservation, making sure that the work we do can be uh, retreated by someone down the line. So we've we've brought this repair now into the 21st century. And um, again, just share with us a bit about how, how you did that. It's really interesting how the tail is made. <clears throat> Originally, they put an iron rod inside that is about one inch in diameter. And in the place where the brake was, the diameter was reduced. And uh, if we didn't do anything, the diameter would be getting smaller and smaller. And eventually, someone sitting on the tail, which actually happens, would just fall with the tail. <clears throat> so we wanted to make sure that we repair the tail in such a way that it's not only stable, but also much stronger. We did not want to remove the iron inside. It was very important to understand that if there is no water, no access of water to the iron, it will not corrode uh, as quickly or not at all in the galvanic reaction because galvanic reaction requires water. So by cutting off the access of water through eliminating this crack, we pretty much eliminated the chance for the iron to corrode in the galvanic reaction process. And maybe we can show the welding. I just want to say that this is one of the best welders I've ever known in my life. His name is Kazimierz Paris. Whenever I have something important to weld, he's the only one doing it. So here he's essentially welding, welding the crack and filling it. But before the welding has to happen, we need to remove okay, lead something. completely. Mm -hmm. Then we need to cut all of the unstable browns to make sure that our weld is going to stick and is going to be strong and stable. And what you see here afterwards, after the welding on the left, I'm finishing the surface. It's, the process is called chasing by following essentially the lines in the sculpture and making that kind of unsightly bump of the weld part of it. And on the right, just a second, this is your, your right too. You can see the completed uh, process. So there is pretty much, even for me, no way to see where the weld was. And the way of recoloring, so um, you, you used a bronze, um, bronze stick to fill in the gaps. The silicon bronze was used to fill the gap. Yeah. We didn't do, uh, well, silicon bronze is really stable and is very good for welding. It's easy, it penetrates, it seals the surface. And then it looks, of course, because it's new metal, it looks new and it has to be blended in. So what I've used is chemical patina to match the color of the surface of the sculpture. Which is also a hot process. That's a hot process. So the yeah. chemical goes on, flashed with heat, and then again, that's a, that's a judgment call of how, many, how, much, um, how much chemical to use, how much to heat it, um, it's multiple, multiple passes to build it up gradually. So I took about, I spent about a day patinating this. It may look like it, it's a tiny thing. It's about, I don't know, surface-wise, maybe 10 square inches. But visually, I didn't want them to be seen. Mm -hmm. That is the goal. 
And so ultimately, we got to the point where we brought them back. They rode back down uh, 290, and we inst reinstalled them in front of the, the museum again. And so here they are in August. And I think, you know, we're, I will speak for us, we are all really thrilled with the result of this. Um, they're definitely a darker green, thanks to the wax. But they're also much more muscular looking, like they look buffer. And that's in part because you can really see the bronze casting at this point. You can sort of see the fine details in a way that you just couldn't before. The old patina had a fairly homogenizing effect. And now with the wax and the luster, all of these fine details look amazing. I mean, and they're actually, always impressive, but now they're quite spectacular. Yeah. This was both of you. It was very important to get rid of all of those streaks because now they read as the whole sculpture, not something that has lines that distract visually. And uh, pretty much if you have a line on something, that's why wearing dresses going vertically make difference appearance when uh, you put a dress that has horizontal lines. Here, sculpture with lines will just attract your sight, your vision, your, your pretty much attention to the, to the... In the wrong way. Yeah, in the wrong way to, to something that you don't want yeah. to see. Yeah. yeah. No, we're, yeah, we're so very pleased. We we're, we're very pleased. It was, you know, this was a moment where the, the press went wild on sort of the, the lions having a, a spa day. Um, and certainly that is something that, um, is, is you could say is true, but I think this really, I hope, gave you all a much better sense of the many decisions that went into this entire project, the ways that it developed, um, and the collaboration that I think was really sort of rewarding and gratifying for all of us to get to this point of, of taking these actions so successfully. So, um, so with that, we wanted to make sure that we leave a few minutes for questions, um, and we're actually gonna ask, there's some microphones at the back if you, Come forward, we have some, a question here in the front. So just raise your hand, we'll get you a microphone and so that everyone can hear the question. Um, and we'd be happy to answer anything you wanna know. <laughs> well, we still, we're, we're recording this, so it's actually helpful with the mic, thank you. Regarding the base metal, what is the base metal? And then my follow-up question is, when it was originally cast, how many pieces put together were included in the lion i mean was it the head the four legs the tail and how did they cover the seams a hundred years ago one thing i can say d definitively having been able to see them up close the the seams are there it's just that you can't appreciate them from the ground but when we were uh, at cso's uh, the seams were really very evident. Um, I, off the top of your head, is it, you know, I would say like at least at least 10 segments. I would say, say between 10 and 20, yeah. every sculpture. Yeah. Like, for example, the, one of the heads of the lions had a casting flow and they were casting it. So instead of recasting the entire head, they cast only that section and put it in place. There were several, several patches. Um, I, you saw mm -hmm. the image we showed, the... The nose is its own separate cast, and that was yeah. pinned in. But um, at least, I mean, down the middle, there's sort of four sections for the body, and legs are half and half, are they it, not? You can see on one of this, I mean, on the hind leg, that there is this line kind of in the back. That's where the casting uh, stops at the, of the leg, and then the leg goes into the base. Base was cast also uh, in pieces. And they also had problem casting it because it's really hard to cast something this big in one pour and get a perfect result. So foundries, instead of, uh, I mean, today it's a different story. Today they can cut and weld in place. At that time they could only cut and insert in a kind of Dutchman-like method, perfect inserts that were then put in place. The insert when they place in, in, the, in the sculpture kind of sticks out a little bit higher, and then they force, they force the metal kind of at the edges by chasing or hammering, and they make the surface look like it has always been there. It's part of the sculpture. Huge amounts of skill. I mean, uh, 
old, I think older sculptures demonstrate a, um, a prowess of, of fabrication that is, it's different today, but I mean, there, there really was an incredible amount of um, know-how in the foundries of, of this generation. But the, the base metal is, it wouldn't have been a silicon bronze. This no, is too it's early a regular for that. bronze it's with regular. copper, thin, and uh, zinc, and a lot of lead, lead. in it. <clears throat> Question over here. So, uh, can you hear me? So, you may have covered this at the beginning. I got here a little late. Um, so, the color obviously is much darker. Um, when the original lines appeared, I assume they were much darker and changed over the years, but I could be wrong on that. Um, what, what prompted the color change to sort of the light green that in my lifetime has been the color? And secondly, um, with the new finish um, and wax and all, will the color change in the future or is it going to remain the same? Should I let you tackle the original so, surface question? I mean, we don't have a lot of great information on what they originally looked like color-wise, I will say. I mean, you know, A, there's only black and white photography. Um, so it's not like we can look, we have a lot of photos of them from 1894, but it doesn't mean that we actually could see and sort of understand the color. But, you know, I think that was a sort of rich bronze color, but bronze, you know, almost immediately starts to oxidize and turn color. Like if you've ever had a um, a bronze watch or anything that sort of changes um, naturally. So we're sort of assuming that the green arrived fairly quickly, um, you know, and I think ultimately this, this minty green that we were so used to wasn't the original color at all. That, I mean, I think that's very clear. And so it was really sort of trying to land at a place that we felt was authentic color-wise, um, even though it probably wasn't the original sort of brownie bronze, but that's a, something we would never be able to achieve at this point. I think and you can see some sort of hint at what the original surface might have been like on the tails, because those, if you if you go out and look, you might not have noticed, but if you go out and look at them, they are brown, sort of a golden brown. Um, and that is that is actually where people have that's touched where people and sit. rubbed away <laughs> yeah. the, this more environmentally induced patina, which is the green. Um, so I, I think for us, there was, because there is this outstanding question of, you know, yes, they were probably likely a, a more a brownish patina originally, but to what extent and were there variations? Oh, you know, the, it's one thing to say it's brown, but there's a lot of nuance that uh, we, we simply don't have information for. And not to say, I mean, uh, as well, that the act of Stripping this off to then repatinate is a, in conservation for us, is a, like a bit of a bridge too far. That's um, that's a that needlessly too inventive yeah. procedure. So I think this what what we've achieved here is we're we're kind of honoring the green that is part of its story on Michigan Avenue, but we've introduced a green that is much more stable, much better for the object, and will stand the test of time. But it will always look green. We will have to maintain this surface. Um, we'll have to wax it every few years. But I don't know if you had anything you wanted to add, Andre, but... Uh... I, just, I just would want to say that people quite often think about sculptures as something that is supposed to last for centuries. Yes, that's true. But uh, if you also think about your car, you buy something that is expensive and you watch, you wax, you clean, you take care of it. Sculptures most of the time are not taken care of at all. So maintenance is, is the key for keeping the sculptures in good shape. By doing what we have done and uh, maintaining the sculptures in the, these sculptures in the future, we extended their lifespan for, I'm pretty sure for a few hundred years at least. And I, I would just add the other thing that I think was comforting is that this green is what we see every winter when it rains. You know, every time it rains, they were turning this green. So we did actually have an expectation of what they would look like. We, this was not a, a surprise to us, I, I should know, we say. We anticipated a shift. Yeah, yeah. I think it was more, I think, managing expectations right. around yeah. the shift that we knew. Yeah. Uh, it, not least, I mean, we did wonder what the public would think, you know, because they they have become permanently associated with that that minty color. 
So, but um, we've we've had, and this was a huge social media sensation. I think it's worth saying, and the the reception has been overwhelmingly. Probably, you know, we we were bracing ourselves for any kind of, oh, we missed the green, but we've right. people have been really really pleased, but also uh, what came through in the course of the the treatment and while they were away was the extent to which they are such a part of the of people's lives, the fabric of the city and so on. So people were very um, appreciative of the fact that they were being looked after. So so a question down here. I'm not sure where the mic went to. Yep. Hi. So for these sculptures, did the artists make models beforehand? So I didn't hear anything about that, like whether maybe like a study, like like Rodin, that sometimes he, he did some, he had made some models before making the real one. And, and, mm -hmm. and I don't think this was the lost wax method. So there was only one of each that was done, right? And, and the other thing I think I had read that each lion has a name, but you never, I, I think I had read that somewhere, but you didn't refer to them with their name. Well, so the, the, the artist didn't actually give them names. He basically said one was an, in an attitude of defiance and, and the other is on the prowl. So, so his, his preference was to not give them a name. You know, honestly, we're more boring and we just say the North and the South line, but, um, but he did, um, there's some great photos of his study from around probably 1895 at Edward Kemi's studies. And you can see little tiny models for the lions or what look like models for our lions in them. Um, and so, you know, I mean, he was an academically trained artist. He would have certainly sort of followed a process probably of sketching, of maybe making smaller models in clay, you know, and then um, working them up. But um, they are sadly, we don't have any of that material in our collection actually. So um, I can't speak to it other than sort of looking at a, a photographic record at this point. So, um, but, they, uh, but they are unique. There are not other lions out there, certainly. So. And to answer your question, yes, they were most definitely cast in lost wax technique. Yeah. We have a question here. We have a question over here, if we could start here and then we'll go. Sorry. Over okay, go for it. Sorry, it's hard to see sometimes, so bear with us. We're hearing a lot about uh, conservators at the Art Institute concerned about three years of NASCAR races, <laughs> a matter of feet from sculptures like this and from the collections. Can you, do you have concerns? Will the lions be covered during this event? Uh, just in a general way, what are the concerns about uh, these kinds of dangers to the collection. Mm -hmm. Well, we're. I think in this case, um, the lions are a little safer because actually the turn of the NASCAR track is um, on Jackson. So the cars won't be going up Michigan Avenue directly in front of the lions, um, which helps. And, um, you know, so there'll certainly be crowds, but honestly, those crowds aren't different from, you know, any other major event, whether we have Lollapalooza or, or other... Um, big public events downtown. So I think it's, it's in that regard, more akin to what we're used to. But I don't know if you want to add as a conservator. So it's the, cur the curator's view. Happy they're turning away first. <laughs> so. uh, the, the vibratory studies that we've done uh, in and around the, the campus over, over years um, have assured us that we're likely not running any, certainly the lions are going to be the last last of the objects that would be severely impacted by excess vibrations. But um, so to answer your question, if we're worried about anything in the building, it's definitely not these. These, these could take the, the degree and nature of the vibrations that will occur from the races uh, isn't going to cause a problem here. But just for the rest, to assure you, we, we, uh, we are working closely with an engineer, a longtime partner, um, of ours, and we we don't anticipate uh, the nature of the vibrations to cause um, cause much concern. We've we've had uh, building projects internal to the building that have generated more. What will be interesting for us to see is the sustained 
the sustained vibrations, but indeed the, the pattern of them will be irregular. So we, we will monitor the first um, test, test races and see, but um, we, we, feel, we feel good about where we are. And I think we have time for one more question because it's just three o'clock now and I know you all have places to go, but go ahead. So you mentioned that this um, sculptor did different animals for the World's Fair. Mm -hmm. Who decided on the lions to be a symbol of you know, that's Chicago a, or of the museum? I, I actually don't know that we have any real sense of it other than, you know, lions have always been a symbol of power and of authority. Um, he was often more of a Western sculptor. I mean, so he was working out in, in the, you know, sort of Wyoming, that area. And so this was actually unusual for Kemi's to do lions, which are of course not um, in the United States at all. Um, but, you know, I think it was, it was more of sort of thinking about a tradition of, of who, what, what animal you want guarding a space. Um, and I will say the photo I showed of the panther at the World's Fair or the World's Columbian Exhibition, um, all of the sculptures made for the most part for the World's Columbian Exhibition were made in, in staff, which is sort of a plaster based material. So those didn't survive um, at all. So, but obviously this was at, out of the question that we'd be using staff, it was going to be bronze from the beginning, so. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's a long tradition of lions in a, in a guardian symbol. So, well, I want to thank you all very much for coming and Rachel and Andre, thank you so much for joining me today in this conversation. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your time here.